Okay, everyone, welcome. Uh, we're just going to get started here with the webinar. First things first, before we get started, make sure you read the disclaimer. Uh, JTrader and I don't really want to be sued by you or chased down if you make a decision based off of what we're going to tell you. Uh, likely not to happen, but make sure you read this and understand it and know that uh, JTrader and I and uh, anything, anyone affiliated with us is not responsible for uh, any of your decisions in the market. Okay, great. Uh, so welcome to uh, large caps, options, and volume profile. Um, JTrader and I decided to get together and uh, you know, we, we're trading together on a daily basis uh, along with some other uh, awesome traders uh, just in a little side room um, that we have for us. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of really great info and a lot of our trading styles um, um, fit together. And we thought it'd be a good to get, uh, idea to start sharing uh, some of what we do uh, with you guys. Uh, JTrader runs uh, his room, JTrader small uh, cap room um, on Discord. Uh, and you can find that on his Twitter at uh, twitter.com slash jtraderco. And um, you'll find details on how to join his room there. Um, and then uh, you can find me on Twitter at DelTheTrader. And uh, you might know me from Bear vs. Pig, where JTrader and I initially uh, met and became friends. And um, there's more details to come on that later. Um, and then um, also need to highlight, also need to highlight um, ActiveTraders.chat. This is um, my trading room. So we'll have more details on that later on. Um, but uh, this is the webinar, and we're just about to get started. So maybe I'll let uh, JTrader say some a few words as well. Uh, good evening, everybody, or good afternoon. Depends where you are. Um, I let <laughs> Adele talk. Um, he's a better speaker than I am. Um, I want to just like um, say two things here, and then go uh, right away into the into the game, the setups, live market trading. So first of all, I want to thank Dell for putting up all this, and I wanted to have a webinar with Dell because I consider her a trader. Um, be very frank, a lot of uh, uh, garbage out there, and he's one trader that he has eight, nine years of experience, which for me are considered the minimum that you have uh, to have to have a chat room to help the others to know what you're talking about. So if you're one of those traders that um, you want to learn something, really re uh, learn something, and not following live trading signals, but really to you know to invest your money and to know what you're doing with your money, to control them, okay? Because that is to have knowledge. Then I suggest you really like to look very good into Dell, uh, the trading material. I trade every day with them. When three or four other guys in a private room, we just like share ideas, and these guys are are tough. You know, they're not like the guys that enter a trade with 10K shares, but that's like, can be a feeler. Um, so I can see different uh, style of trading. And I see my style pretty different to Dell. We have the same goal at the end of the day. Um, we look at the same things, but with different approaches. So what we're going to talk about will be very, very interesting. Okay, Dell. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks a lot for that. I really do appreciate that. I say always the truth, bro. I say always <laughs> the truth. Being we are in our little room or being that we are here. You tell it how it is, man. That's it's, it's always been. Um, yeah, you, so you'll, you'll, you guys are going to find out right now how different our styles are. They're very different. Um, and so JTrader is going to be talking about large cap stocks, options trading, and uh, most importantly, from small account, small account perspective, because that's really what's what's important uh, uh, and then i'm going to be walking through um, after j trader i'm going to be walking through um, volume profiles some structure analysis and doing a top-down proper technical analysis of the market and i'm going to try and dispel some of the some of the misconceptions about technical analysis and try to unlearn you 
some of the things that you may have learned in the past um, that I found to be uh, total uh, horse poop. So anyway, uh, I'll let uh, J Trader uh, take it, uh, and we're going to start by screen sharing, um, and we're going to start going through um, uh, all of the stuff that I just mentioned, um, and then also before, just before I start, just make sure that you guys are aware. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, if you just joined us, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little Q and A um, icon. And that Q&A icon will allow you to uh, ask questions. Uh, the questions will be upvoted. So as you can see here, I'm just showing you some of the questions that are already starting to come in. Um, if you like the question that you see in the Q&A, uh, just click the thumbs up uh, and it'll go up. And uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a little Q&A session where we answer from top down the most popular questions. OK, all right, let's get started. OK, guys. So. I tend to be very uh, uh, fast in what I say and very direct. So first, thanks again to be here. What I want to talk about tonight is talking about two main things. Um, we are mainly, or at least people are here mainly, uh, small cap traders, OK? But I didn't start with small caps. I started with big caps uh, almost two decades ago. And um, I was trading, uh, before even trading equities, I was trading warrants and cover warrants and options. So basically, I built a lot of my capital from that, especially I was using cover warrants, which are almost the same thing as options, at least in Italian market are the same thing as option in the uh, US. So uh, why options? Because it gives you the possibility to have a huge return with a small move, a uh, percentage move of the underlying stock. What I mean, generally, uh, and this depends from um, the option that you choose, but uh, it can happen that you have 1% move on Netflix and your option will go like 30, 40, 50%. So you can see a day that, like yesterday on Netflix, we dumped uh, more than 20 bucks. The option can go like three, 400%. And you don't need, like for Netflix, you know, if we look at Netflix today, what was 290, 300, yeah, 290. You don't need uh, to buy 100 shares and pay uh, 29K to buy it. Uh, when you go on option on Netflix, if you get some in the money, so we start like looking some puts and then I will describe everything. You basically need like, uh, one tenth of that, so like two thousand five, three thousand dollars to buy one contract, and you can like sell it for two, three, four times more in the same day. Okay, so whenever you want like to build your account, your account, don't think that the only way is with the small caps. Uh, the fact is that even one, two contracts can bring home a paycheck. So let's look together the the main things you have to know. So options are. So the, the cheaper way to play big caps, this is it. When they talk about premium, you know, you will see in rooms or Twitter, that's the cost you, you, you buy, the cost you have to, to pay for the option. And there are mainly two things, uh, calls and puts. Calls if you want to long the market, puts if you want to short the market. The strike is the price you think it will go to exercise your option. And whenever we're talking in the money, is basically, um, example here, uh, we are like 288. So puts in the money and out of the money. So you will see that the price out of the money, uh, they will be like cheaper. Okay, so like right now 288 on Netflix, uh, puts out of the money are cheaper than the one in the money. Okay, so you will you will pay a lower premium for the out of the money compared in the money. Then we have delta and all other things. But what's more important is to choose the option. So basically, you will uh, see people like playing strategy, straddle, uh, spread. And the main thing that you have to look for is to choose the option in relation to 
the price you think it will go. So if you think that Netflix, example, uh, these days at 300, you see this downtrend, you think that this will go like 280, play an option 280 put. You think this will happen in uh, one month or in two months, choose a longer expiration, so a longer uh, time frame like uh, and December, okay? So remember that two things. To choose your options, you have to know where you think the price will go and when it will go. If I trade intraday, I basically don't have this problem. I will like look into the weekly options. So every Friday you have the expiring of your options. And I will look for the next target. Uh, yesterday, I was playing Netflix. Actually, my mother was playing this, and we will look why soon. But the price was basically here at uh, 300 when she started shorting, and she was looking for target 270. She was playing in 285, 280, and 275 puts. So I always have used TC2000 to see like the option chart, okay? But you can basically use everything. Okay, so just to give you an idea, this is what Netflix did yesterday. Okay, let's look at 285. And basically, tend always to see the most traded uh, option. So you see today the most traded was uh, this one here, 285, and this one here, 280, because people were thinking that this would have gone so much lower. Okay. So basically, we see here how it moves an option. While the price of the stock went from 300 till a low of 280, the price of the option went something like from 275 till 9 plus. So you can see how is the difference in percentage. So basically, you want to see Netflix short because the trend is short, because everything is pointing down, because the queues and the spy are point, and pointing down, then you look the most traded option weekly, because you're going to probably nail it for one, two days, okay? And you're going to basically trade that. So it works like a bid and ask, you buy it, okay, and you sell it. That's it. The only thing is that instead of having the price here, 300, 295, or whatever, you have basically this, okay? You have basically this. And that's it. It's so simple. So what I do, put my stock, and I put the underlying option, the relative option to it. And that's it. Um, today, I want to talk about two main strategies that I use. So first of all, I want to look into Netflix. So when I look in big caps, I trade uh, both long and short, but I don't know why when it's short seems like to be always going smoother and I prefer short for that. So I buy generally puts. So the first thing I do when I see a big cap is to see where this is comparing to the 70 to 89, which are my two Fibonacci expansion emas, where the price is if above or below. I use uh, you can use whatever, but I use basically this line nine ama or thirteen ama, what whatever you prefer to see the inter the intra trend I call the mini trends. So we see basically here from the 9th of November, the price shifted and started below, and it's going down. So let's look what happens with our stock. So basically, we are here this day, the 9th. So basically, each pop I will have, it will be a short for me because we are below these two, Emma, and because we have this mini trend that is starting to form, is opening below the, the 9, Emma. So let's go to see in depth. You see, when we start in the morning, I will always see a failed push. You will hear me talking about failed push. So when you start basically and you see this stuff, 
you can use a one, three minutes, five minutes, whatever you want. And then I see a fail. That fail is my short. Generally, the confirmation of the fail will be when this loses the pre-market support. Okay. So basically, a fail push, tier one, adding tier two and tier three. Okay. Or basically, shorting one third and adding here two thirds. And this always uh, has to be below the nine or below a five or below 13, whatever you prefer. But you have to know that this is a mini uh, short or downtrend. So the day after, we start basically looking here and we have a push, but here continues like to be above the 729. What happens over here that it dumps and then start rejecting. So this one here, this level here on the reject, this is another short. And when you see this here, 294, okay, and here you have a dip till 289 and 50, 290, you see here these four bucks. Well, these four bucks can be like a 100% on your option. So how to choose your option when you are here 294, okay? So basically, this is three days ago. Let's look together. Let's put just a three minute chart. So basically here is the 13, which is this day over here. And you have to look when the price here is 294 for the bigger, the biggest, uh, the bigger, sorry, uh, whole round number. So you have the 290, that 290 will be my strike price. So this was three days ago. But this 290 is my strike price. And I will look to short into that. Okay. In this case, uh, that will be my, my put. So let's go to see yesterday because this was the move I want to talk about. And this is like my favorite scenario. When you have a mini trend, guys, and remember this good, look for the close and for a gap up. So in pre-market, you already know that this is gapping up, okay? But you're in a mini trend. So this you can play on all the stock you love, Apple, Netflix, Google, uh, AMD, Twitter, or, or whatever you want. But you have mini trend, close, gap up, wait for that field push. You see this field push? This over here established a high. And then each pop that will go, and would not break this level, it's a short. Short with this risk. So this 350, this 299, 250, and all this area here is a short with this risk because we established a top, okay? And then you will go basically look at your option. And you can see, example, uh, here we are at 300, we will look in for 295 or 290. So let's go to see a 295, uh, pretty expensive, pretty expensive premium. But you basically buy this around six, six fifty, seven dollars $7 per contract. And this spikes up at 13. So you have basically 100% move and not even a couple of hours. So this is how they move, okay? No reason to buy, what, uh, 100 shares, 200 shares, 300 shares, 1,000 shares here. Just buy one contract. So this is basically uh, trending Netflix or trending stocks, something like Apple. Another thing I want to show instead is another setup. And for me, it's an A-plus setup. When I see this kind of setup, I tend to load the boat. So this was PBYI, 2nd November, okay? I want to show you the day because I played this. This was a big gap. So whenever I see a gap like this on bad earnings or bad news, you know, it can have like a, a fraud sentence, can have like a, any kind of uh, uh, bad news uh, coming like PCG uh, lawsuit filed, the price will gap down. 
you will have a pre-market where you, you, you would set a pre-market high and pre-market low. Well, here we didn't have a failed push, but we had a breakdown. So on every time the breakdown of this pre-market low, that will be my trade. And look always for the second day fail, because on the second day, you could have still the same pattern. This is another example, same kind of setup, WTW, pre-market gap down on bad earnings over here. We establish a low here in pre-market and a high over here. So on this breakdown of the pre-market support, and even here in the rejection, you enter short, and where will be your targets? Your target, basically, when you don't have like AMAS, because they are all like above, you have basically to use daily support. So uh, you go to see the daily chart or whole dollar numbers. So 50, 55, 60, and so on. That, those will be your uh, triggers for the exits. The last thing I want to show, and then I leave the word to Dell. We will look together how the options went on this, guys. So PCG is a stock that yesterday I really nailed it good with some guys in the room. Um, we know bad news on this. We know how this is like below the 739 is below also the daily 200 AMA and 200 CMA. So really is shifting bad, okay? So we know that there's a negative sentiment. And here, uh, yesterday, we were exactly over here. And this is the same chart. We saw basically this dumping pre-market put in here. Uh, pre-market low. So the first thing you have to do in the morning is set your pre-market low and setting your pre-market high. This is a pretty big range because we have like eight bucks on this. So remember what I said that on this bad news, I want to see a fill push or the break of support. And here you have a fill push right in the morning where we establish a top and right here a lower high so from here on all these pops that we will have will be like entries risking this high over here and what happened how to choose the puts on this so let's go to see pcg we are basically here around 28 so we will be looking for 25 puts let's go see 25s this is um puts expiring 16 November so they are weekly because they end this weekly and these other one we are calling them monthly so we have to go see basically how both traded so here we have a premium of seven dollar you see how this is different how much how much more premium you pay compare like to a 300 strike put on Netflix uh, because they make you pay on these uh, uh, more liquid stocks, that amount of premium. And you see basically here, once it made this top, okay, yesterday you could buy this option at $1. And it went to almost $4 on this dump. So you can see how these move. And remember what I told you on this bad news, bad earnings, Look for the second day. Second day again. Trace your pre-market low, pre-market high. And here on the break of support, you have your other entry and dump. And look today what it, it did. So today the price was at open at 25. So we will be looking for probably um, lower strike. So if you go to see basically lower strikes over here on the weekly, you see basically nothing, no traded. If you go to see here next week, you will see starting around two, went to 450 and still coming down. 
So this is really like, I would say like the magic of the options because you don't need to invest uh, $22,000 or whatever to buy 1,000 shares. You basically need to invest like uh, six, 700 bucks to buy one contract, which is a big difference. What do you think, Del? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just answering some questions and some people um, just confused in general about options and, and the basics. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just sharing with them uh, a link to YouTube where I just searched option basics. And if someone were to go and just watch those videos top down, uh, even the first few videos, they'd understand the basics and then they can come back and rewatch this webinar. But yeah, uh, I see what you're doing on the charts and you know, these are killer setups just just killer setups if you can catch them at the right time. It's especially with options, it's all about timing. Exactly, exactly. And guys, you will see many times that on options, you don't have time to put limit orders. Okay. I know a guy, Smash, my friend, is very good trading options. I will like suggest you to uh, go follow him if you're interested in trading uh, options. And he loves to put like limit orders, he's, he's a beast on this. I prefer like more to use market orders. Example in this liquid ones, you know, like uh, today a P24 on um, on PCG went basically from two bucks till almost seven guys, almost seven. Okay, so this incredible moves, and you need to buy like two or three contracts, five contracts, ten contracts, not that much, you know. Yeah. Like with already one thousand invested, you can have a very good return. And if I could just like last week, I took an options trade on TLRY. This is a, a weed stock when the cannabis was going nuts. And, um, you know, I didn't even catch the beginning of that move last week, but I did catch, I did jump into an option that I saw that wasn't moving yet, but I knew it should have been moving. So it was basically worthless. If you picture an option, like the further away it is from price, uh, the less, uh, the cheaper it is. I bought that really cheap and I knew that as price was continuing to explode higher that my option would become a bit, um, more and more valuable. And I, I traded it from 85 cents all the way up to $9.50. And that's that's the type of power that there is behind options if you under, understand them and how they move. I remember the day I was with you and that was a crazy move. So guys, basically what Dells is saying is that he bought an RTZ option. The fact is that he was buying cheap option like sub $1 per contract means that one uh, sub $1 means that one contract would cost below $100. This is. So if you buy like 10 contracts, it's say $1 premium, that will be 1000 bucks. But with his investment went more than 1000% in that same day, okay? He brought home something like uh, $10,000, okay? With only 1000 of investment. While you need a big buying power to buy uh, TLRY, pay the fees, and that's crazy fees. I pay a bunch of fees lately on TLRY to have not even the same percentage of return. Okay, Dell, you want to talk now about uh, your setups and uh, I leave the word to you, okay? Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, Jay. It's been uh, really great there just seeing the strategies and how comp uh, how deep you go into each of the strategies. Uh, now, one thing that's really powerful about Jay Trader's strategy that I find just, just uh, um, giving you my, my opinion on it is uh, he's incredibly consistent in the way he trades. And I'm talking very, very, very rules based. And this is the only way to extract any type of statistical edge out of a, <clears throat> out of a trading strategy. Imagine having to take a trade a thousand times over. How many times out of a thousand times would you be winning? If it's you know more than half, um, then you're for sure, even with poor um, poor uh, position sizing and risk management, even still, you're probably going to make a profit. The majority of traders will, will you know, lose around 75% of the time. And with poor position sizing and poor risk management, that is a nightmare. But with good position sizing and good risk management and proper knowledge of the markets and everything JTrader has been talking about, 
uh, even if you do the strategy wrong, you can make money if you mind your risk. So uh, just absolutely, I absolutely is like this. Um, so I just want to run this poll quickly with you guys. Um, let me just share my screen here and make sure that it's short shared. Just want to run this poll quickly with you guys, uh, just so we get an understanding of the people and, and where you are with options. I'm going to launch the poll now, uh, and you should have that on your screen at the moment. So just, and it's pretty cool actually, we can see all the updating there. Uh, and the question is, how comfortable are you with options? Uh, a lot of people are confused by options because you can get really, really complex with them. And like JTrader was, the strategies that JTrader is talking about, there aren't they aren't incredibly complex option strategies. Uh, you're literally buying calls and buying puts. Buying a call is is thinking that the the stock is going to go long, right? So call. If you buy a call, you're thinking the stock's going to go up, and if you buy a put, then you're thinking the stock's going to go down. And that's all you really need to know when you're looking at the options chain. Now, uh, second to that, obviously, you need to know how the option, ch option chain works and some more basics around uh, options. Uh, but anything more advanced than that, like complex option strategies with multiple legs, butterfly patterns, condors, that type of stuff, you don't need to worry about that. All you're doing is riding momentum on the underlying stock by buying, and, uh, buying calls or buying puts. So uh, think of that um, and then uh, go and do your own uh, your own research. You know, I always recommend um, traders do their own research in Google. And I think, you know, the most uh, successful traders are the ones that are out there Googling constantly, have a thousand tabs open, managing the way they learn. And that's what you need to do as well. So on, on bear versus pig, the whole idea is to make sure that uh, the information that comes across comes up across genuinely uh, at the level of of uh, at the level that that particular trader is at and they're not dumbing things down for your for your sake uh, because uh, you know all this stuff can get very complicated and it's just important that you understand that you need to go do your own research if you want to be successful great so how comfortable are you with options uh, the majority of people said not comfortable at all and great because if you said that you un if everybody said they understood them um, you know, you're all liars. <laughs> you know, like I trade options and I have a very hard time explaining to people what options are. Um, so that's my piece of advice uh, for options. Yeah, guys, the only thing I suggest to you is not to make it difficult. Really, I would have liked, it was, I was really 19 when I started trading covert ones, which are the same thing of, on options. We had that on a European market at the time. And it was basically only looking at the stock with the options uh, chart near, okay, and price of the option, and basically trading, looking at the stock, but using the option. That's it. That's it. The only thing is you have to find a good option that follows very good the stock. So basically, if it's like Netflix today, uh, 300 the price, and you're looking to short it, I will go with a 295 and 290, um, the most liquid uh, options um, to trade. Generally, I like to trade out of the money. I want to pay a small premium. I don't want to pay expensive options. And the more these are out of the money, the more I will like swing strategies for them. So it means that if I'm looking for the next two, three days, to short Netflix, so buy puts, I will be looking for a larger out of the money strike, so like a 270, 280. And that will be less expensive to buy in the money compared to buy in the money options. Therefore, I can risk the money that I put inside there. Let's say I pay 500 bucks for, that will be a $5 contract, okay, premium. So, I pay 500 bucks for one contract. So I risk those 500 bucks, but that move will give me maybe four or five, six times what I'm paying. So I will get like maybe 2,005, 3,000 bucks back if my investment will go good. So it's like, it's not like playing casino. 
but it's like knowing your odds, knowing that if you have a good strategy, option on the long term will pay you much more than the stocks. Exactly. Very well said. Um, and uh, I was just trying to help what you were talking about by drawing some stuff on the screen. So I hope that <laughs> made sense to people. But anyway, uh, enough about the option stuff. I mean, we could have an entire webinar about explaining options. Uh, I think the main point is, you know, go back, watch the recording of the webinar uh, and Liz and, you know, pick apart JTrader strategy there um, because uh, that that's the way to properly risk and position size yourself and in the market using uh, uh, charts uh, to make money using options, um, especially for that small account, right? Okay, great. Um, all right, so now that you've got uh, somewhat of an understanding for uh, JTrader's strategy for using options to trade, um, and uh, I think a lot of people are, uh, are, are still gonna be uh, in that zone where they're testing uh, and they're going back and forth and they're looking at the chart and they're looking at the options chain and they're not really sure what to make of it. Once you figure out, uh, once you connect in your mind the options chain to price, then you can start thinking about strategies that you m might want to implement. And that's where JTrader strategy is going to come really, really handy. Um, so what I want to do for you guys is I want to help you understand the way I break down a chart. Uh, from a top-down analysis using uh, what I like to call market auction theory as opposed to the classical auction market theory. Um, and I also want to talk through some structure and some basics. Um, I also want to kind of help you unlearn some of the things you may have learned in the past that are bad habits when it comes to charting uh, and also a bit of a change in mindset. Now, um, I did get all of your questions, uh, so don't worry if your question hasn't been answered yet. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go through at the end, uh, and we're going to walk through the questions and uh, uh, answer them all, f all, the, all the ones we can anyway for you. Okay, so first things first. Um, and just to be clear, you, I, I'm showing you how to break down a chart from the top down so that you can implement whatever type of strategy that you want, including the option strategies that you just learned um, uh, with a full understanding of, of the chart. Um, okay, so two things I want you to understand very quickly on the chart that you're going to see and everything else um, I don't want you to worry about. You'll see that I trade with what's called a, a naked chart. Um, I do have some moving averages and all that that are on the on the screen, but for the most part, I trade with a naked chart, um, and the averages are just help me gauge, um, you know, from a higher time frame, the direction the stock is moving. That's all. Um, so volume at time is one of the indicators, the main ind volume indicators that I'll be using. Um, I use that. That's the one that you always see at the bottom of the page. So we've got time at the bottom, and then we've got um, each one of those time periods lining up with the candles. So if you've got a one minute chart on Apple, one of these sticks will be one minute's worth of volume at that particular time. Uh, and if you've got a five minute chart of Apple, then this will be a five minute bar, right? Uh, and you, the power in having volume at time at the bottom of the page is that you can see relative moves just just by visually looking at it. So you know that at 11.10, this move in Apple was a lot bigger than the move at 11.20. Cool. Next thing, very simple, just basics, uh, is volume at price. So this is what people normally call volume profile because that's what it is. I mean, technically, the volume at the bottom of the page is also a profile, but we'll just say that this is volume profile. I like to call it volume at price because, you know, volume at time, volume at price. And this is the exact uh, opposite. Um, so this is volume at every particular price level. How much volume was deposited at the particular price level, either inside of, of a period um, of maybe like your charts view, right? So every, every uh, period inside of this chart view, calculating all the volume at at that particular price, giving you that histogram on the side of the page. Um, and the other way you can look at it is intraday, intraday volume, which looks like, let's say this was the 930 open. 
then the volume histogram would start filling out here depending on uh, where the start of the day was and uh, it would change as you know you got to let's say four o'clock right um, eastern time which is the, the close of the market and then you've got maybe another one for the, the pre-market so that is volume at price and volume profile it's clear awesome oh i'm also listening here because i'm interested in this <laughs> good um you know every time i feel like every time i explain this stuff uh, i understand it a little bit more as well so I, I love explaining it um okay so here's a chart of the spy um i'm very busy on the spy right now um, i'm using all of my powers to try and figure out what the spy is doing uh, but what you'll see on the chart right now is you know the volume at price and then the volume at time and this is on the five minute chart and the areas in the middle here, uh, the, the slightly lighter areas are all pre-market and post-market action. And you'll see that volume is non-existent inside those areas. And it's because um, volume isn't really collected by most, um, um, I don't know the technicals too much, but I think by most exchanges, it's not really like shared or, or uh, at the level that it is when the uh, market opens up. So you'll see a, a large um, influx of volume um, but I bet you that a lot of these uh, pre-market days are almost just as f uh, full as some of the uh, the in-market uh, trading times. Um, okay, and then just one more thing at the bottom of the page, uh, the one indicator that I like to use, and the guys at in my trading room at ActiveTraders.chat, uh, they know that I like to use Relative Strength Index. So this is the RSI, and it's just the base RSI, uh, which I think is the 14 period. Uh, which basically goes back uh, 14 days um, and calculates um, the relative strength index. Uh, it's an oscillating index. So as you can see, we've got 50. Uh, price will off often return to 50. If the price moves sideways, it's going back to 50, basically. It moves up, then you know, this, as the strength goes up, it, it goes out to the extremities um, and in either direction. And I basically use this um, to uh, not to try and time the market, but uh, to have the market tell me whether the strength of a move is overbought um, or oversold. And that is likely to have um, a retracement back to the mean, which is the, the 50 mark on the RSI. And that's really all you should be using the RSI for. Um, there's some techniques inside of the RSI that you can use to try and identify um, trend changes like one is uh, RSI divergence. So divergences meaning as, let's just pick one here. So let's um, let's look for, let's say this one here. So if we see this high here, we know that this is an, an extremely overbought high um, because uh, the price is, uh, of, of the stock has began to move higher after a relative high move. Uh, the RSI shows that relative move uh, and then shows that the the angle um, at which the next peak on the RSI is actually sh uh, lower or beginning to go lower than the peak on the price chart. Sometimes it's really obvious, like sometimes you'll have, uh, you know, the peak be like this on the RSI and the peak be like that on the price chart. And it shows you that there's an extension that's far beyond uh, where it should be. And that's what they normally call overbought. And that will usually lead to a reversion, a reversion on the RSI back down to the mean. This technique works with the volume histogram sometimes as well. And it also works with uh, delta, price delta. And that's how many orders have been added or removed from the market uh, in, in an accumulated delta. So, uh, and just, just to clarify that, this meaning price higher, and the RSI lower on the peaks, let's say. This is what they call um, uh, bearish divergence, right? When it's out, it's bare. Oh, excuse my writing. When it's out, it's bare. And then when it's in, when the prices are looking like they're moving inwards as opposed to outwards, then that is what they call bullish divergence. A question for you from me, Del. 
shoot. You you use this often every day, right? I use it every day. Yep. Okay. You know why, guys? I say because I always see um, Dell coming up to me and say, "Oh, divergence, divergence." I say, "What the fuck is this? Always divergence." <laughs> And then I, I start incorporating also in my trading. But actually, trust me, both small and big caps is so damn effective. Really, it's not bullshit. It helps you anticipate the, the trend, the shift. Go on, Dell, sorry. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what it is. It helps you anticipate the shift. Uh, now, using divergence on its own to try and identify a shift is um, probably suicidal for your account. Um, because there's nothing that says that um, that uh, this divergence can't keep getting wider, right? So that's why it's not used sure. for timing. It's just used for sentiment. Okay, so that's uh, that's enough about the RSI and divergences. Uh, let's get back to the volume uh, profile stuff. So volume profile, um, I traded futures for many years. I traded crude oil, uh, uh, gold. Uh, I traded the ES as well, the ETF. Um, in the world of futures, um, I learned uh, from James Dalton, who is one of the main ar architects of market auction theory, or auction market theory, I should say. Uh, futures Trader 71 is another guy that uses um, volume profile analysis a lot. Um, there's also another uh, another method that's used a lot in futures that's very popular with volume traders, and it's um, called the Wyckoff method. Uh, and basically just, I mean, I've gone through, um, and I've, I've gone through, I've gone through everything you can possibly think of, um, advanced patterns when it comes to like Fibonacci, uh, when, like Gartley and bats and all of the, the crazy stuff. Um, I've gone through Elliott wave theory. I've read books on Elliott wave theory and I was sort of a technical junkie. Um, and I was lost for many years, um, because I, did, I, I mean, there was so much, so much stuff going on in my head. I didn't know how to pick it all apart. So I decided to create uh, market auction theory, which is my own version of dumbing down everything and taking only the pieces that work and plopping them into a strategy that works cross market. Now, when I was trading futures, I learned that uh, a n number one, knowing what goes on behind the candlestick is the most single most important um, sort of tide turning. Um, thing that you can do as a trader is fully understanding what's behind a candlestick, what creates the candlestick, and then ha and then understanding how useless candlesticks become uh, when it comes to, compared to the rest of your analysis. Um, secondly, um, the other thing you need to realize is that um, trading a chart, you are not, and I'm going to just explain this very carefully to you guys. This is probably my main turning point in trading when I started becoming profitable is just understanding that technical analysis itself is not about predicting future price movements. You are not predicting where the price is going to go. That is, if you hear anybody tell you on Twitter or whatever, that this is where price is going to go, um, you know, start putting money behind it. Um, you know, they're a charlatan. Um, technical analysis is about defining market sentiment and identifying future areas of conflict on the chart. So you're using the past, everything that's happened in the past to identify price levels that when price, if I should say, if price reaches that level, that there is going to be conflict. You're not saying that it's going to go higher from there. It's going to bounce from there. You are saying that it's going to, it's going to be conflict. And what I'm going to show you next will be able, uh, you're going to be able to make um, a educated guess as to the likelihood of price spending either the most or the least amount of time at that particular price level. So just think about that for a second. If you are able to, as a trader, say that, you know, let's say 275 on the S&P, just as an example, let's say 275 on the S&P, if price reaches that level, that there is going to be a reaction from the market. You can say that with complete certainty. Um, and that when price reaches that level, it is most likely that price is going to spend either a lot of time at trading at that level or only a little bit of time. So let's uh, let's go into that and talk about, I guess, the basics of uh, 
volume analysis. Um, and I'll, I will give you this really quick way to do a top-down analysis of the market right after I explain to you distributions of volume. Let me go back here one second. Okay, so we showed you the histogram on the left. We showed you the histogram on the bottom. Um, and why am I so focused on volume? Uh, there's only th really three things that you need to worry about and you need to be fully aware of uh, on any chart in any market. Um, it is time, price, and volume. And, volume. and that is, oh, that's <laughs> volume. Guys, he's drunk, don't worry. He's always like this. <laughs> So time, price, and volume. Um, if you understand time, price, and volume, you don't need indicators. You don't need some guru telling you um, to, to use their you know, specific indicator that's gonna give you all the answers because you will have an understanding of market sentiment. So all of this equals market sentiment. All right, so volume we identified, right? Uh, price is the last thing we're gonna identify. Don't worry about that. Um, and then uh, time is something that we're going to go over right now. So time is, is uh, now think about this. Time is the amount of time that a particular, that price will spend at a particular price level. Um, so if you've got price moving around all day long, doing crazy moves, and then all of a sudden it gets to a level and it starts ranging inside of that level, you know, and it starts putting in some kind of a, you know, what they call support or resistance. Then that's the, and price leaves that level either to the downside or the upside. You can be sure that when price returns to that level, that there's going to be some kind of an effect, right? There's going to be some kind of a conflict there. Um, and it's just because of the fact that price a spent a lot of time there, and b deposited volume at those at that level over and over and over again, and that creates this sort of ripple effect in the market that goes off into the future. And and when price returns to this level, even years later returns to this level, you know that there is likely a high high likely likelihood of more conflict at that particular level. So that's price. That's uh, that's time, and this is the only thing you need to worry about right now when it comes to this time, price, volume analysis. Uh, the last thing you need to know before we do our top down is um, a uh, distribution. So I'm showing you. I've shown you volume on the side, volume at the bottom. I'm just showing you volume sideways right now, just because I want to show you volume sideways. That's it. So let's say. Um, uh, this is the volume curve, okay? So this is what they call a distribution of volume. This is what they call a balanced distribution of volume. Meaning if the price, these are the price levels below, if these are the price levels below, you know, let's say zero, or let's say, um, let's say 50, let's say zero, and this is 25. And then we'll say this is like what, I don't know, 15. This will be 35. Um, I know that at $25, the most amount of volume, let's see, there's a like, peak in there. The most of vol amount of volume was deposited at $25. Uh, and then the least amount of volume over a particular period in time was deposited at $15 and at $35. So we call the $25 mark um, a high volume node or point of control and we call the low volume areas price levels that were barely touched by the market um, LVNs I like to call them low volume nodes and these these are areas in the market where there is what, technically the least amount of value so if you look at it like um, in, in terms of value um, when somebody spends a lot of time uh, at one or when a group of people spend a lot of time at one price level trading at one price level, that is the most popular level, right? Popularity. Um, and that popular level 
is important. It's important. It'll be important in the future if price ever returns to that level. Whereas a, a, a less popular area is what they call uh, least fair value, um, isn't really popular. And if price were to ever swing up into that uh, low volume area or low value area, nobody wants to trade there because it's the most unpopular level, right? So um, imagine a lunch room with a whole bunch of kids and a bunch of different tables and all the geeks are sitting at this level right here and all the cool kids are over here. Um, so all the cool kids are probably going to get all the attention from the babes and um, the nerds are, are just repelled by the babes. So the prices the ba are the babes. Okay, so just think of it like that. Kind of a different analogy that I've ever used, but I like it. Um, so that is a volume distribution and uh, just keep that in your mind, right? So one more time, as price reaches areas that are of unfair value or, f or fair value or most popular value, uh, price is going to want to spend more time in the popular areas than in the unpopular ones. That is the basis of market auction theory and what I teach at ActiveTraders.chat with my with my team. All right. That's a good one, Dale. Thank you, bro. <laughs> awesome. Glad you enjoyed that. Um, so now I want to see. I want to show you guys the top the top down analysis that I promised you. So I'm going to walk you through. A chart we're going to go basically out from let's say the, the highest i can the monthly and we'll go down from there so i'm going to use a slightly different tool because it's a lot clearer and there's less junk on there uh, let me clear this out um, and just one more thing um, if you guys are looking for the platform to use in order to see volume distributions please, please, please do not use programs that don't give you detailed volume information. So I'm going to go down to the one minute on the SPY and I'm going to zoom all the way in as basically as far as I can. Look at the size of each of these bars here at each price level per penny information on volume. Um, some platforms, I'm not going to name the platforms on here, but some platforms do not give you this level of detailed information. And you'll see that as I scroll out, the profile gets thinner and thinner and thinner and more detailed. I need this level of fidelity when I'm reading um, volume uh, profile. I just need it because I'm identifying areas of low volume, areas of high volume. And if your chart looks like this, when you've zoomed out on or added volume profile, um, just go ahead and toss it inside of your garbage can uh, because it's completely useless. All right, so programs you can use. TradingView is one that I use. I love TradingView. It's great. It costs money. Um, everything good in this world costs money. Um, and the other thing you can use is um, Thinkorswim. So Thinkorswim uh, is is uh, free if with a with a deposit, I believe. Um, so I'll let you just go and figure that out and, and explore. Um, program that I've been using for a while, actually made here in Canada by a Canadian, uh, is Motive Wave. Um, I've owned this for a really long time. Don't go out and buy it with uh, just because I have it. I don't know if you would do that. Um, not because I won't get any royalties from it or anything like that. It's just there's there's cheaper ways. Um, so I'm going to use this to go from monthly down. So let's go out to a month, let's say, on the queues. Actually, you know what? Let's do something even better. Um, I want you guys to tell me uh, what stock. I wonder if you can do that. I'm going to jump into JTrader's room. Let's see if they're listening. Maybe somebody wants to drop out the name of a stock. NBEV. Okay. Andy Andy K suggested NBEV. Yes, NBV. Just just to show you that I like I haven't really prepared a, a chart specifically for this because it fits my my style. I hate when that happens in webinars. Guys, it's all set up. It was <laughs> like all set up. Don't trust me. <laughs> Good job, Andy. <laughs> right on time, pal. Um Okay, so we're going to go out to the monthly here on NBEV. 
Um, so first things first, top-down analysis. I'm going to use volume profile, I'm going to use structure, and I'm going to use um, my time analysis. Okay, um, so monthly, as far as it goes back on NBEV, first thing I notice is that higher time frame, this stock is moving higher. Okay, so where, what is my, my bias? My bias is bullish if I'm trading on the monthly. And if I'm trading on the monthly, I'm seeing price pull back here. I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's a bottom somewhere and this thing's going to turn around. That's my mindset. Um, from the monthly. Now, looking at the distributions of volume, um, I'm looking at a couple things. Number one, are there balanced distributions of volume? Does the distribution have that beautiful curve in it, or is it like an ugly beast? Right? Um, if it's an ugly beast, then it's most likely that price is going to come back like a little worker and fill in those gaps. It's going to come back and spend more time inside of that area, filling that area to try and make the distribution look balanced. Okay. So this is a pretty balanced distribution right here. And it, it's, it's sort of like a health check, right? Think of it like the health of a distribution. So this one's pretty healthy. Uh, this one's okay too. This one definitely needs some work. Garbage. All right. So that's the monthly. So my bias on the monthly is bullish. I haven't picked out any levels. Oh yeah, one more thing. Please do not try and um, identify important levels by how many times price has touched that level. The classic way of looking at support and resistance um, is is okay because you, you're, you're sort of identifying areas on the chart that are important, um, but you're not really getting down to the understanding of why that level is being touched over and over again until you understand the volume. And once you understand that it's the volume that's creating that support or resistance level and not, you know, like one touch, second touch, third touch, you know, support turns into resistance type of stuff. Um, we're talking about deep volume understanding, knowing that where the fair value is and knowing that price wants to spend the least amount of time uh, at that nerd's table. Uh, where they want to go to the more popular area where all the consolidation is. All right, so rejection, acceptance. Rejection, right, price rejecting these low uh, value areas and price accepting the high volume areas. Okay, so looking at the weekly chart now, I can start seeing a little bit more fidelity here. Um, you know, bullish, bearish bullish and really bearish. Why really bearish? Because price came up all the way to test that really nice distribution of volume that we had and deposited very little volume at the highs. Price is telling me that it's, it doesn't really want to spend too much time there, that those prices aren't enticing enough. And it uses the momentum move back to the downside to cross the high volume areas and explore the, on, uh, the, the lower bounds of that value. And that's where you see that really big sell-off price spending gap down, right? Gap down and then sell-off price spending the least amount of time, time, the least amount of time possible inside of those low value areas. So if I'm a trader and I'm looking at trading this on the weekly and I see that price is maybe around the $7 level and it's looking like it's continue going lower, I'm, t I'm saying to myself, if price accelerates, I want to jump on board and I want to see if price rejects this uh, low uh, volume area like it did in the past, right? Rejection, 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 um, and bounces or just breaks through. Uh, obviously, breaking through if I'm short is the best possible scenario, but maybe I want to take some profits there to protect myself and hold on to a runner to see if price will break through that low vo uh, volume area and break down. And if you're using options or using JTrader strategies, you can take a look at the higher time frame to see that top-down analysis and see where the bias is to the downside. Where Where is the popular table and where's where the, where's the geek table? Um, and then that, that'll help you with that. So now we've got bearish short-term sentiment. Uh, bullish long-term sentiment. And then I'll run through the last ones fairly quickly because I think you get the gist of it. Down to the daily, right? I'm not squishing down the chart as far as I can anymore because it's not really that important what's happened in the past. I've already identified that. I know that these levels here are important, the ones where the distribution is. And now I'm looking at in more detail this move. That's where I want to get more fidelity in. So what's happened at that inside of this 
one particular move. If I'm using the volume profile where, where it fills my chart and it gives me the information inside of the range, I'm looking at the distributions, right? Now I have more fidelity inside of the distributions. What needs more work? This area, it's kind of gross. That needs more work. This one's pretty well defined. There's a really nice point right there for the point of control, right? That's a really nice higher time frame point of control. Marked it off on my chart. Um, and I can see that price is below has tested these low value areas and is likely coming back up likely coming back up to test um, the point of control from that distribution. So now I've got a bearish sentiment. I can draw a trend line. I know that there's a point of control up above. I know there's a balanced distribution up above and I know that price needs more work to the downside. Right, so you can see where I'm going with this type of analysis. And the faster you are at going deeper and deeper, the easier it is for you to go from the four hour, you know, maybe down to the two hour, maybe down to the 15 minute, you know, and identify even down to the one minute this works. It doesn't matter what time frame you're on, there's always distributions of volume to analyze, and there's always low uh, value areas and high value areas. So there you have it. Um, that is um, the top down analysis of the market. And then you can use that to always follow your bias uh, based on your analysis. And if you want to say enter a trade like this using options, uh, maybe maybe it's a um, maybe it's a, another stock like a like a uh, uh, a Netflix or something like that, you'll have even more volume information because there's more volume. Um, and you can use that top-down analysis to give it to you. And the one-minute chart here on NBEV, we know that it's been it's been bullish, but you know the levels that are up above. Uh, you know where the low-value areas are. And if you see price reaching that low-value area, maybe let's say let's say that price was reaching this low-value area into the high of the pre-market session, then uh, a good risk opportunity would be to maybe start shorting into the test of that uh, high-volume node and having your stop. Um, at the rejection area of the low value area. So at ActiveTraders.chat as part of uh, the course that I put together, I've got about, um, I think it's close to four hours of video training. Uh, I walk through this top down analysis, but in more detail, and we have very specific parameters and very specific setups. We only trade three setups, the AT1, AT2, um, and our AT3. And these are the three setups that using market auction theory um, work best for this specific type of analysis. Uh, and we track and we trade these every single day in the small cap market. So that's that. Thanks, Dale. Uh, it's time to answer some uh, questions, bro. You bet, man. Let's start doing that. <clears throat> Okay, so you want to start from the beginning? Yeah, you bet. Okay, let's uh, see what we have over here. Yeah, let's do this. Uh, thank you, screen up. Um, so first, I have Brian Lilly, right? Let's see. Option. Do you want to read it or do you want me to read it? I, I can read it. Options are generally a riskier investment than simply buying or shorting down the line equity. When you play in options, are you risking the entire amount of the premium or do you have stops or your option play? You want to answer this, uh, Dell? Yeah, sure. Um, so when you're playing an option, uh, what you're doing is you're purchasing um, a piece uh, a piece of the uh, potential of the underlying stock. Um, so let's say you buy one contract um, at, let's say it's at uh, $1. This is a pretty expensive option. But let's say you buy that. Um, what you're actually doing is you're buying one contract at $1 um, for, let's say, let's say the stock is at $50. It doesn't really matter what the strike price is in this example. So one, one contract at $1. Um, what you do is you take that $1 and you multiply it by 100 because every contract is worth 100 shares of the underlying stock or the underlying asset that, that you're trading options on. Um, so if I bought one Apple contract at $1, I'd have to multiply that one contract by 100, and that equals $100. Now the question is, are you risking $100 
you know, can you lose all of that? Technically, yes. But um, what you can do is, uh, what you do is, because this contract will expire, let's say in, let's just say it's in seven days. Um, there's value in this contract all the way up until seven days, or all the way up until um, it um, it's a certain distance away from the the uh, underlying price. So all that's to say is that um, it's not like you buying this uh, contract will automatically put you $100 in the hole. Um, you will have a PNL curve that starts moving as soon as you buy that contract and the maximum you're able to lose is $100, right? So at some point in this time, maybe it'll be worth zero, but it'll never be worth less than zero. And if this period is seven days, then you could sell it here, you could sell it here, you could sell it here, whatever, and not have to eat that entire loss um, all the way back down to zero. So that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the answer. Okay, next question. Can you describe how much options play a role in the overall stock price action? I don't know what this means, bro. Um, how much options play a role in the overall stock price? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think so. I think I know what that means. Okay. Um, okay, I'll give it a shot. So um, Delta is something that you might be talking about here. Um, actually, let's let's not get that technical. So the, the, um, the option, if you have an options chain and the options chain is like 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 150, let's say, 200 um, and the actual price of the stock is like you know uh, like 110 uh, and you buy a stock that's all the way out at 200 it's gonna be worth less than a stock that is at let's say a hundred um, and so um, if the stock price has a volatility where it normally moves a hundred bucks at a time, like it has a crazy high volatility, then this stock is going to be worth more and each price movement is going to be affect the stock price even more. But if the stock only moves like a little bit, you know, and it maybe takes like a long time in order for price to reach that level, then the stock's going to be worth less. So that's, I think that's the answer to your question. Yes. Let's go with another one. Do you spend much time on the Greeks while they're trading weekly options? Can I answer Del this? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Not really, guys. I am very direct. I like to trade options, call if the price I think is going up. I like to uh, play puts if the price is going down. That's it. That's the only way I look at them. So, uh, don't you think, Del, or you uh, pay a lot of attention at Greeks? So, Del, yeah. Tagama, Tate, and all this stuff. You know, basically, guys, you have to know that delta is the amount that is moved with one dollar change in the line in stock. If you have a delta zero seventy, means each dollar the stock move, the option will go like zero seventy and so on. So um, I generally don't look too much at this thing, delta theta like this. I look the most liquid uh, options. And I just see the chart and I see comparing to the stock how much this moves. That that's it. It's very simple. Yeah, that's a good answer. Unless you're using complex options, you don't have to worry about too much. Um, and if unless you're holding it for an extended period of time, like you're buying it like four or five months out, then you might have to learn a little bit more about that. But for day trading to short term swing trading, don't worry about it too much. Another question from Aaron Stadnick. When looking at the FANG chart, do you primarily base which ones to trade off the daily levels? I notice some traders trade Netflix every day, for instance, so it is more beneficial to play off daily levels, or you just work one stock over and over? Um, if I have to answer this, I have some charts that I trade each day, some stocks I trade each day, like Netflix, and I look often to um facebook those two mainly so i basically know each day uh, the most traded uh, netflix options i tend to rely on them i know how it moves i know how the options move 
so I'm basically like you know trading you know at home and then yeah I trade like new gaps or new setups every day you yeah. want to answer something more Dell or should well, I yeah I just on? want to mention smash the bid so smash trades Netflix every single day um, just like in the podcast he was talking about this uh, in particular um, so I, I definitely suggest looking him up um, I'm I, I haven't really been trading daily intraday options um, that often um, and I, I really just started getting into it a lot when I uh, met uh, or I spoke with uh, smash and I, I sort of promised that I'd get into it and I did so now I'm loving it and I'm having a lot of success with it um, but um, if you want to learn about Netflix J trader and smash are the guys to talk about talk to then another question actually they're asking how you can be so beautiful for having so many years brother <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no let's be serious still uh long day over here so uh trading is a race between for you dell your entry point and your level of conviction dell trader what do you mean oh yeah uh that was a tweet that i tweeted out uh last week i think um i tweeted that out because i was just thinking about um a trade that i'm taking in the spy right now where i was short the spy um, I was talking about and kind of like bugging the guys in the room over and over again about this um, S&P 500 short. Um, and the reason I, I, I tweeted that was because as a trader, your number one thing is to convince yourself in the trade so that when price reaches that's that level that you've been eyeballing, you have the conviction um, or, or the balls, as JTrader would say, to really pull the trigger on the trade and have that full level of conviction and then not only take the trade but hold the trade down to where it needs to go um, and if your conviction isn't there yet or you slacked on your research um, then your outcome isn't going to be as good or you're going to make too many mistakes because you're you're jittery so that's that's why I, I posted that tweet because that's that's really the main thing is can i convince myself you know my wife sometimes has to be like give me a rule like you're not allowed talking to me about stocks when after this particular time at night because <laughs> you know, I like I'm constantly convincing myself by talking about it so yeah. okay another question from Brian Lilly do you always close your option position intraday or do you ever swing trade options if you swing an option and now you're buying a call or a put do you take into account time decay okay I can answer that very fast yes I also swing options, but I have to have a conviction for this. I generally swing options, which are monthly, so not weekly expiration. And yeah, you basically go to see the theta, the time decay. But uh, uh, this depends always from uh, where you think the price will go. So if you think like, uh, I have some conviction. We'll go to seven, then to forty. Netflix in the next months. So basically, I swing that, and uh, we we build a position into that. So let's go another one. Roy Fukahashi. Uh, will you have a recap of this on video YouTube? Yes. Another one from Brian Lilly. Price movement of the underlying stock is not the only factor that affects the price movement of an option. Do you take into consideration other factors such as volatility? You want to uh, answer, yeah. Dell? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I sort of alluded to that when I was talking about a stock that moves more is going to have a wider range of strike prices that are uh, more highly affected by the movements in the price. Um, so, yes, you have to take that into account. Uh, and trading trading uh that's why you, you should really the other thing is make sure you're only trading stocks uh, high, uh large cap stocks that have um a lot of options volume or a lot of implied vol uh vol implied option um volatility because uh you don't want to be stuck into a, in a position where the stock moves but there's no options to trade right so the answer is uh, yes we take it into account uh, the best, like Netflix, for example, has a lot of volatility, and therefore the options move a lot, and, and that means that we can make more money on it. Okay, another question. Short trader, aren't price volume divergences 
way more important than the price RSI divergency? You want to answer Dell? Being that you use the RSI, I, yeah. I can tell that you really come from the futures for that fact, bro. That you use <laughs> yeah. RSI. Uh, the answer is no, it's not. Uh, okay. It's just they're just different. Uh, they're just different ways of uh, of looking at the market. Jordan Ryan, and this is also for you. You became popular tonight. Intraday, would you say volume profile levels are stronger than intraday? candle levels this is also important guys listen it's very i would like to know what dell thinks uh so uh volume profile so it's it's not a chicken before the egg situation when it comes to volume and candlesticks uh candlesticks are an indicator uh volume is a structural component of the market so behind a candlestick is a distribution of volume it doesn't matter what period this could be a one minute a one month a one week one year candlestick but a candlestick only shows you the open the close the high and the low whereas the, the volume inside of that level and the period of that level like say it's a one minute gives you an enormously larger amount of information so um, volume is always and volume profile is always more important than what the candlestick has done in any one particular period. Okay. Um, another one. This is for me. Can you explain mini trend using another stock like Apple? Okay. I would need to screen share this. Uh, we are a little bit out of time, but basically, I'm looking at Apple daily. And the first thing I see, I look for is where is that compared to the 7289 Emma? And then, according uh, looking deeply, I go to check or a five or a nine or a thirteen EMA, where the price is, if above or below that EMA. So you can choose whatever these. Uh, you basically need to see like a mini trend, so like higher highs and higher lows, or did lower highs and lower lows. Uh, did you want to share your screen? Um, or I can put it here. Uh, just one second. Uh, because I had another screen on. Sure. Okay. Let's see if this will work. Okay. So basically, I think you see my old screen over here. Yep. So this is Apple. Okay. You see, basically, this is a mini trend on Apple because it's basically starting to be below. Uh, in this case, I have a 5 FEMA here. But it's starting to make lower highs, lower highs. So all these uh, days over here, I will only look to short this. Okay, so that's the main point. Okay, uh, let me see what else. Jordan Ryan, only thing about market orders with options. Sometimes you don't a lot right away scary. Okay, I know what you mean. Yes, Jordan, if you enter the open something like netflix today or even better yesterday yes you have to be aware that um using market orders will put you right away in the spread zone so for the open the best thing is always to have limit orders trying to catch the bid always for both calls and put but during the day i like to trade market orders especially if it's there like a very high volatility okay so you don't need to fix the price and all this stuff and get out. Just market order. That's it. Um, do you guys focus from NN on directional option trades or more complicated straddles, iron condors, and all this stuff? I read all this stuff, bro. And uh, I think it was like in the 2010 or something like this. It really... Uh, fucked up my mind. <laughs> Straddle actually is very simple, but no, I don't use all that uh, into my trading. And you, Dell? Um, I I do, uh, but it's uh it's in my long term trading accounts. Um, I'll trade what they call uh, volatility volatility short trading. So uh, I'll be doing like I'll be, try and collect option uh, volatility premium using 
like iron condors and or uh, straddles or strangles things like that but um that's that's really long-term stuff um okay not in day trading travis kirshner let's say you only want to risk 100 bucks for an option trade but option on your target strike are too expensive can you buy cheaper out of the money options even though you know it's not likely to hit your strike but then just sell the option back once you've made a profit okay uh this happens very often so if i have to answer on this and i know that my price target won't be hit okay because i'm playing maybe a weekly option and in two days netflix has to go from 300 to 260 i will not buy a put 240 so much out of the money because i want to play uh, pay it cheap i just will pay something like just out of the money or at the money or in the money okay so the nearest strike prices and i will just like trade intraday so pay a little bit more and that's it i mean uh if you want to buy an option because you want to trade option because each option you think is cost 100 bucks no if you have 100 bucks in your account you cannot trade not options nothing not even put in the roulette uh, at least you need like at least two three thousand bucks and then you buy cheap options john pecknick how do you pre-define risk on options trade for example if you want to risk 100 bucks and be that your premium how do you know which option to buy consider one contract is the minimum if you want to risk 100 bucks and you want to buy one contract means that um what else the the contract you want to buy it will be like the strike price um one buck right dell yeah exactly short trader dell what is the name of your charting platform i think you already said it yeah, trading, view. trading view okay i'd give Anonymous you my affiliate link but trading. i don't know how to do that so okay <laughs> we can post later um or you can write Dell like an email or on Twitter and he can uh, like write you back. Anonymous attendee, can you please explain how you use volume profile on large cap, uh, cap trades? Wow, this is uh, already what we, we've said. I mean, like, I think, at least for me, Dell, correct me if I'm wrong, is the same thing that, that you have on the small caps. Yep. Uh, another one, what are the blue dotted lines on the chart I think is uh, in your charts though uh oh those those are just price levels that i identified uh in the past that's all they're just what uh, is horizontal the, okay. uh, rulers what is the difference between the two volume nodes on the bell curve one on the left and one on the right uh, so he's talking about this bell curve um so uh, they're both low vo uh, volume areas that's all so a bell curve is basically uh, maybe this price is ten dollars and this price is a hundred dollars uh, but the price in the middle at let's say i don't know 50 bucks or whatever is the highest price and then the two extremities of that distribution are the low value or low volume areas that's that's all the, the difference between the bell curves uh, edges which is the granularity on volume profile no why is the granularity sorry on volume profile important uh, because if you don't have a granular volume profile you can't spot uh, the changes um, in uh, in volume as well as you would be able to from a more granular profile that gives you more detailed information um, so um, you, you yeah. wouldn't you wouldn't have all of the information right? it's like looking at a it's like it's like having a a, a 640 by 480 screen versus yeah. a 4k screen dell do you use motivate mo motive wave for any ewt work for a, a macro view uh, i'm trying to find where where is it? sorry around 10 zero two <laughs> don't know what it means Oh, here it is. Uh, do you use motive wave for any EWT work on a macro view? Oh, Elliott wave theory. Um, uh, no, I don't use Elliott wave theory anymore. Uh, I'm not going to go through what Elliott wave theory is, but it's a basically it's a 
it's a it's a mashup of of uh, structure and Fibonacci retracements and extensions. Yeah, because uh, then I will start talking about GAN and Cow's theory as well. Exactly. So uh, no, I don't I don't really use that anymore. I found this this strategy to be far more efficient. So Brian is on fire tonight. What came first, the chicken or the eggs? Do support resistance price levels generate the volume? Or does the volume generate the support resistance prior levels? I'm not into this philosophical stuff, Del. So if you want to answer, you can answer. Uh, definitely uh, the egg, I guess. So volume uh, okay. generates the support and resistance levels, 100%. Aaron Stadnick, it is valid to draw support resistance base on the close of high volume days using the volume Instagram of the on the bottom of the chart. Um, no volume. Uh, when you're drawing these levels, there are zones. They're not levels. Anybody that tells you that uh, support and resistance is one price level is not doing it right. It's exactly. A zone. It's exactly. A zone. If you look at um, PTI example, I was looking the other day with some guys on the daily, and I take into consideration high volume days. So, just want to show this because I think it's important. Sure. Uh, let me see main screen. Okay, it's a big screen, so I hope you all see it. You see all these uh, areas I have here, guys. So let's put even bigger. Wow, drive you crazy now. And this is me after ten hours or more at monitors. So you see over here, basically this high volume day. So for me, the close and the high of this, all this area is the volume. You see basically these one, two, three, four high volume days. So all this. From the close to the eye, all this is high volume area. And then I will go inside to look with a five to minute chart where are the high volume and low volume nodes, as Dell explained. So when at the end you go to see on that big gap up day, flow rotation, and we all know what happened, you basically go to see all these lines, but it's not these lines itself, it's what is inside. So it's all this, all this, all this, and so on. More. Can you explain AT123? Oh my God. <laughs> uh, no, no you have to sign up to my course. <laughs> Rob Melgarejo, I have seen that sometimes in the volume at dollars, you can split between red and green color bars. Is the color matters to you? Okay, I, I answer and then you can answer back. Uh, for me, no. I just need to see how the price uh, close, if below the open or not. And that the only thing matters. Many of my charts have not the color. You know it from the close of the bars. Yeah, I agree. Can you explain NAK day to day using volume profile analysis? That's for you, Del. Oh man, um, really? Maybe really, really quickly. Maybe another time. Okay, maybe another time. <laughs> <laughs> One issue I have is that the stock, if the stock is below VWAP, it considered bearish. But if a stock is a clear up trend, clear creating higher lows. Do I anticipate it's going to fail VWAP or I'm long biased because it's an uptrend? Okay, I can answer very good because every day happens. So you have to keep into consideration what is the float of the stock? At what time you are on the day if this stock is generally manipulating? You're referring to this like today on NBEV. And if you look at NBEV, at what can do? Going up VWAP, then fall below VWAP, trap more, and then go more up and squeeze everybody and manipulate. Like if you put VWAP today, in the morning we were below around um, 9.45, like that. And then around 10.15, we reclaim. And once we reclaim, all the people they are stuck in the morning, they were like uh, short strap, and then like started to go up and hold its dip. So basically, those are the main things you have to look, okay? So the float, even the person to short float, if a stock manipulated and trapped in the past and bad guys is like, you know, the A1 for this. Can you explain the Greeks? Uh, we already spoke about something. It will take only one webinar to explain that. What are the parameters you check for options liquidity? Only to go to see the volume traded uh, for the option in that morning or the prior day. If you work with weekly options, Okay, just go see the strike you're interested in. Look today and the day before what were and are the volume traded. Uh, there is like a long one. 
and then I'd there is for, i'd also look for implied volatility so the, okay the iv on the day you wanted that that implied volatility to be high another one how to build that conviction you are talking about so we are talking about conviction maybe you are talking about conviction yeah, yeah. Uh, well you have to use all of these methods that we're talking about together you don't really have conviction until you've traded for a few years and you've really understood the markets then you'll, you'll find that real conviction short term just try to understand everything as well as you can and form your own opinions another one it was um uh, what you think about nvda now how you can trade option with it you cannot because after four o'clock you can't another one uh, we have the last two over here do you find any value exploring the unpopular babes that might be low key super hot uh, for example do you find those levels on the bell curve an area where you have a short or a long setup yeah, so the, the areas, uh, the low volume areas, you shouldn't be thinking about whether they're long or short areas. You should just be thinking about the type of act of action that there's going to be at those areas, right? Remember, we're not trying to predict uh, how price is going to move, only that there's going to be uh, some kind of a decision made there. So that's why you use your advanced order flow analysis, book map, your level two, your tape reading to really understand the battle between buyers and sellers at that particular price level. Another one, Aaron Stadnik. Dell, do you use any indicator at all since you said you use a naked chart or is it primarily based on price reaction to price zones? Uh, I don't, uh, the only indicators I'll use are VWAP. Uh, some basic moving averages um, and RSI um, and then my volume tools. So I guess it's really not that naked, but it, it's naked compared to a lot of people's charts. Okay. I think we're done everything. That's it, man. I want to thank everybody for joining us in the room. I think we had like a really killer uh, 66 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, we didn't really... Um, uh, we didn't really go off too much and I think we stuck to our plan and, and we got through a lot um, and I definitely want to do it again Jay so uh, thanks for coming yeah. up with the idea think in the next weeks guys there will be another webinar uh, on another matter uh, always with me and Dell thank you very much guys yeah and if you guys want to find us uh, make sure you check out uh, we both have live trading rooms. Uh, we both have education and stuff that we're doing every single day for our members. Um, so for JTrader, head over to JTrader's Twitter. It's at JTraderCO, and you'll find details on how to join um, his trading room. And for me, um, you can find me on Twitter at DellTheTrader, and you can head over to ActiveTraders.chat, um, where you can join our community, uh, take the course, or, or just follow on Twitter and, and keep in touch. Goodbye. Have a good day. Goodbye, everyone.